take down this screen share. And I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Lowe. I'm the Adult Program Coordinator here at the Lewis Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening. And now let me introduce today's guests. As if I could get my intro to open, I would introduce today's guests. And it's not responding. There we go. So welcome to the Lives in the Law series. This series brings together noted figures in the world of law, lawyers, professors, journalists, and activists to join in dialogue about their lives in the law, along with how their work bears on some of the most controversial issues of our time. Ronald Collins hosts the series, including conducting interviews and inviting dialogue. Tonight's guest really doesn't need introduction, but I will do it anyway, and that is tonight's guest is Lawrence Tribe. One of our nation's leading authorities on constitutional law, Lawrence Tribe is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor and Professor of Constitutional Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School, where he has taught since 1968. Professor Tribe has argued 35 cases before the Supreme Court and has worked closely with members of Congress over the years on a variety of legal issues. He also helped write the constitutions of South Africa, the Czech Republic, and the Marshall Islands. Finally, Professor Tribe has written more than 115 books and articles, including his celebrated and much noticed treaties, American Constitutional Law. Ronald Collins is the library's distinguished lecturer and creator of the Lives in the Law series. He first met Professor Tribe late in the 1970s when they were but very, very young men, I'm sure, and then edited a book with an essay in it by Professor Tribe. So Professor Tribe and Ron, welcome. The floor is yours and please remember to yeah. unmute yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. And thanks to all of the wonderful people at the Lewis Public Library that make these events available free of charge. I emphasize free of charge because <clears throat> there's few of these that are uh, that way. And so the way you support uh, the public library is by supporting them, patronizing them, contributing to them and what have you. So again, thank you to Rebecca and all of the good folks at the Lewis Public Library. Uh, before I turn to uh, our, my uh, discussion with Larry today, I just want to point out uh, that we have uh, the, the uh, Lives in the Law series. Uh, there's a lot more coming. Uh, it hasn't been posted yet, but we have the Dean Strassen, the past president of the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the first lady of liberty, as she's been called, a remarkable woman. I'm happy to say that our Delaware's own uh, Judge Thomas Ambro from the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit will be joining us. Uh, Adam Liptak, the New York Times correspondent for the Supreme Court, will be joining us along with a couple of other federal judges. So stay tuned, check the Lewis uh, Library calendar. And now, and now it is, what a, what a joy it is to um, engage in conversation with Larry uh, Tribe, who actually changed our world for those of us who were progressive and living during the uh, early years of the Warren Court uh, with a remarkable treatise that just changed the intellectual and progressive landscape of, of American constitutional joy. And so for that, uh, I don't know if I got around to thanking you when your treatise came out, but it's been a long time overdue. Uh, Larry, thank you so much and welcome, if only, if only virtually, to Lewis, Delaware. Thank you so much, Ron. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and so there is so much to talk about when it comes to the arc, the remarkable arc of your life. And I'm hoping uh, that we can get a rain check from you to do another Zoom event, maybe later this year, to talk about that. Uh, uh, because today there's so many important questions uh, to talk about. But uh, if, if we could have just some kind of general uh, consensus that maybe we can get, uh, get you back uh, later in the year on a Zoom event to talk about your remarkable life in the law, we'd love to do that. I'd be happy to return. So thank you very much. So let me just talk about, raise at least just one question having to do with your life. Will you please tell us what your major was in college and how, if at all, that major affected your outlook on life and law? Well, I majored in mathematics, and then I had a National Science Foundation fellowship in mathematics, working on my doctoral degree. And I guess I finished the oral exams. I'm what people call an ABD, all but degree. I, I abandoned the field before getting the doctorate. Uh, but mathematics was my love and remains the field that I 
think is the most beautiful and extraordinary in all the world. And if I were ever to have a, a second chance at this, at this great life, it would be probably as a mathematician, though I don't think I would make that much impact in that field. Well, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, come May, we'll be interviewing, I'll be interviewing uh, Sylvie Vey, uh, the daughter of Andre Vey, the famous mathematician. Uh -huh. Uh, he'll probably tell us he planned a career in constitutional law and it just didn't work uh, Well, I wouldn't mind trading places. That would, <laughs> and he's done remarkable work. I don't know what his daughter has done, but Andre Ve is, is one of my heroes. Oh, well, we'll uh, more about that later. So let's talk about something really exciting. Um, how about the emoluments clauses? All right. Oh, yes. Oh, all right. We're rolling now. I mean, I really wanted to talk about the dormant commerce clause, but we'll have to save that for another day. Um, so there are two emoluments clauses in the Constitution that pertain to the president. Uh, can you explain them and tell us about the litigation you were involved in uh, pertaining to the emoluments clauses? And just, just before you turn to that, I'm curious, do you see the emoluments clauses as basically advisory or do you think uh, they're enforceable? Well, for one thing, they are not about something that you apply to your skin to avoid getting a sunburn. When I first started talking about the emoluments clauses, people said, well, you know, what is that? I thought you were a law professor, not, a, not somebody who would hawk lotions of various kinds. Uh, th there are many parts of the Constitution that, that are more or less hidden that haven't really surfaced very much because they establish norms that have been taken for granted and followed by people because they've simply had the character to take them seriously. The emoluments clauses are among them. Uh, Article one uh, basically says, and I'll just read the relevant language because my memory may not be perfect. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States and no one holding an office of profit or trust under them shall without the consent of Congress accept any present emolument office or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince or foreign state. Well, you know, the framers were worried about American officials, especially the president, being beholden to foreign kings, princes, and foreign states. And so they said, you can't take benefits from them. You can't be on the take from a foreign government. Because if you are, we won't really be able to tell whether you are acting in the interest of the people of the United States or in the interest of some foreign power, and ultimately in your own interest because the foreign power might make you better off financially or politically. People obeyed that generally. Occasionally, people would get some tiny gift. Uh, Barack Obama, I know, got various presents. And then he sought the advice of various lawyers around him as to whether these things had to be returned. Uh, but the first president we've ever had, who quite flagrantly made his whole job an emolument magnet, a way of gathering income and riches and benefits from the Saudi prince and from Moscow and everybody else. The first president we ever had who did that as a matter of routine practice was Donald Trump. There's another emoluments clause less important uh, in Article 2 of the Constitution, which basically says the president's salary, whether it's as fixed by Congress or just a dollar a year, as many presidents agreed to make it, uh, is all he's supposed to get from the US government. Well, this president, of course, collected lots more than that from various federal agencies, from the Secret Service, from the agencies that made it possible for him to violate the terms of the lease for his Washington property. He's basically been a you know, a vacuum cleaner sucking in money from American taxpayers and foreign governments. And the emoluments clause, like much else in the Constitution, is not self-executing. It doesn't automatically jump into action when somebody violates it. And no statutes have been enacted to enforce it. And so I worked with 
lots of various groups. I won't bore you with the details. They involved a group of restaurants and hotels that were basically screwed by the president's ability to get business that would otherwise have gone to them. They represented the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia and various others, members of Congress, uh, all of whom sued the president for violating the emoluments clause. And we basically, you know, lawsuits take a long time in this country. And it took the whole four years to get these cases ginned up to the point where we would win. And we did ultimately win various attempts to throw these cases out of court saying this group or that group didn't have standing to pursue the matter. But when it was all over, the president against his own strong insistence that he never lost the election, the president is back in Mar-a-Lago Mar and the emoluments clause cases ended without any ultimate resolution. So if we're gonna make them more than just hortatory, more than just advisory, we may need legislation to enforce them. There's so much that needs to be done, but the urgent needs of the present in terms of the economic catastrophe and the coronavirus catastrophe, those in immediate needs get in the way of a meaningful legislative agenda to plug the holes the constitution leaves. And among those holes, other holes that are represented by the currently barely enforceable nature of the emoluments clauses. All we could get if we won would be a declaration that the president has got to basically disgorge his assets, put them in a blind trust. He would have slow walked that until the end of eternity. It's very hard to enforce. Well, of course, there's always the impeachment clauses, but before we get to those, uh, let's talk a little bit about the president's uh, pardon power and ex actually how absolute it is. Uh, you've written, uh, as with so many other things about this and about the breadth of the pardon power. Um, um, and, uh, but so the question I have to ask is, can a president uh, pardon himself uh, for any reason? Uh, can he pardon anybody for uh, any reason? Um, what's your sense of that? Well, my sense is he can pardon anybody but himself. There's nothing in the Constitution that says he can't pardon himself, but the text, the structure, the history, the underlying centuries of, of tradition that say that you can't be a judge in your own case, I think would lead a court to say that a president's attempt to say, pardon me, uh, not simply as a way <laughs> of saying it's okay that I bumped into you, but as a way of exonerating himself, that that wouldn't fly. But we don't know. It's never been tried. No president has ever done it. Even this president, as far as we know, has not done it. The pardon power is otherwise very sweeping. He can't pardon people for violating state laws. Everybody agrees about that. Some people think he can't pardon his co-conspirators in an effort to cover up crimes. That's never been tested. In my own view, the very fact that the president's pardon power is really sweeping, it extends to essentially anything that has been done that might violate a federal crime up to and including the moment that the pardon is issued. He certainly can't pardon people for crimes not yet committed. But the very sweep of the power to pardon people is part of what makes it possible to treat a pardon as part of a criminal conspiracy to obstruct justice. That is the pardons that this guy dangled in front of Roger Stone and Manafort and others would have been worthless if one could have said that they're invalid because these people are in cahoots with the president then he couldn't have gotten them to do his bidding by offering them these pardons because they would have said, the moment we invoke them, they'll be thrown out. It was the very fact that the pardons he dangled would likely be upheld that enabled him to use the promise of a pardon as part of a conspiracy to cover up his own crimes. And so at least in theory, if Merrick Garland, as the new attorney general, were to go after the president for obstruction of justice, some of the pardons that he dangled in front of Stone and Manafort and others could, because of their breadth, 
be potentially used as evidence once the pardons had been granted that the conspiracy had been consummated. It's a very complicated thing. And I, I think, in fact, we have yet to see the end of it because a lot of the pardons that were issued had loopholes. They didn't cover everything. And because they left loopholes, they didn't go as far as the president's pardon power would have permitted him to go. The people who received them are now on the receiving end of criminal investigations that they thought they were not likely to be exposed to. So when President Trump um, um, finally left office, uh, many people were taken aback by, by the fact, and I put fact in quotations, <clears throat> that he didn't pardon himself, his family, and uh, others. And so I had what I thought was just a remarkable insight. Um, of course, with so many of those insights, I find out when I Google them that you beat me there. <laughs> so, so the question I have uh, is, can a president secretly pardon himself? So what if on January 5th, President Trump um, and his family uh, secretly recorded, video recorded, and had it notarized and what have you themselves and all sorts of others, and he signed all of the requisite documents, but waiting to play his hand if and when uh, he or his family or others uh, were criminally prosecuted. So the question is, can a president secretly pardon? And the answer is? The answer is, I think, yes, if it's a pardon that would otherwise be valid. That is, he could secretly pardon any of his family members or co-conspirators, as long as it's recorded and official and it's only a federal pardon and it doesn't purport to license future crimes, the fact that it was hidden in the Resolute desk rather than put on CNN or MSNBC at the time probably is irrelevant. Although I can fashion an argument about why pardons are supposed to be public and why a secret pardon would be ineffectual. A secret pardon of the president himself certainly would be invalid if a public pardon of the president himself would be invalid. But All right. secrecy wouldn't alone invalidate it unless you buy my theory that implicit in a valid pardon is the fact that it be publicly accepted. I don't know that that's a theory that the majority of the current very conservative court would accept. I suspect it would not. So, uh, well, we may soon find out, uh, depending on, uh, on some litigation that's currently going on as to whether or not a secret pardon um, uh, was issued, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk a little bit about impe impeachment. You co-authored a book a few years ago called uh, To End a Presidency, The Power uh, of Impeachment. Uh, looking at the two impeachment um, uh, cases that uh, President Trump was involved, do you think his quit acquittals in the Senate reflect the weakness of the arguments uh, accusing him of impeachable offenses? Or uh, do you think those acquittals tell us something different about the impeachment power and whether or not it is alive and well? Well, I certainly do not think that his acquittals reflect any weakness in the impeachment articles themselves. When he was accused of the first impeachment offense of basically strong arming the president of the Ukraine into pretending to be investigating his primary opponent for president, uh, that was a clear abuse of power. It was a clearly impeachable offense. The House of Representatives was right to impeach him, and it was predictable that a Senate in his hip pocket uh, would acquit him. That only proved that the impeachment power is no stronger than the political spine and character of our system, which is dependent on the people themselves and not only on abstractions. The second impeachment was clearly the most extraordinary in our history. Not only was the president impeached for essentially trying to overturn democracy, to engineer a coup, to remain in power indefinitely on the theory that any votes against him were by definition illegitimate. 
but it was also the most bipartisan impeachment in history. And the Senate vote, even though he was acquitted, was a vote of 53 to convict against 47 to acquit. Not quite the two thirds, obviously, but a majority. What that proved was that the, that the impeachment power is alive and well, but it's not going to succeed in removing or disqualifying presidents uh, who manage to orchestrate a position as basically cult leader in a group that will blindly follow him over the cliff, even if it means the end of the American experiment. So I'm happy with the impeachment power. Our book predicted that it ought not to be used lightly. It wasn't. Our book predicted that it wouldn't succeed in removing presidents when the political alignment made it impossible. That was correct. Um, people say, why not make it easier to remove a president through the impeachment power? And I say, go at it, draft it. Let me look at what the amendment would look like. It's not gonna get passed, but whether the design that results would create a presidency too dependent on Congress uh, to make the presidency as powerful as we need would depend on the details, as many things do. Well, given your foresight, maybe we can turn to this uh, later. If we have some time, we should ask you what forthcoming books you have, um, but we'll, we'll hold off for a moment. Uh, a judge, uh, former judge Michael Luddig, uh, a respected conservative appellate judge with whom uh, I guess you've been involved in cases, um, he wrote uh, in, in an op-ed that once the president left office, the Senate could not try him. Um, what is your sense? Do you agree with him? No. I mean, I agree with some things that this very brilliant, distinguished uh, former judge has written, but I think he was wrong on this one. It seems to me quite clear, and most scholars, I think, agree with me, that once a president has been impeached or any official has been impeached and the House impeached this president quite lawfully while he was in power, that once that's happened, uh, the fact that it happened so late in this presidency that he couldn't successfully be put to trial, convicted and disqualified from holding office in the future, which is one of the explicit remedies Congress provided, is irrelevant to the Senate's power. The Senate under the constitution has the power, the sole power to try all impeachments. And I think that that certainly includes an impeachment like that of Trump. It would be really bizarre if the fact that Trump's ally, at least in this phase of their, of their tango, uh, if his ally, Mitch McConnell, simply by delaying the trial as he did, by insisting that the Senate not be called back into session until a day before the end of the president's term, could then say, oops, it's too late uh, to conduct a trial. That would be crazy. The framers were not that, were not that dumb uh, as to design it. And there's plenty of precedent supporting my view rather than Judge uh, Ludig's view. Although I, you know, he and I respect each other. We've well, I want to get to the day that you were involved in the case together, but before I do, um, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, who I'm hoping we could have maybe by the end of the summer, um, I mean, he's really obviously very busy, but uh, one of the things uh, that he brought into the American vernacular was the January exception. Can you say a few words about that? Sure. I, I should say, first of all, uh, that when Jamie, who was a former student of mine and a good friend, uh, when Jamie and I were talking about what the second impeachment should look like and how to overcome the claim that because the president had managed to run out the clock, he could no longer be tried, I suggested to Jamie that we consult Tim Snyder, really a brilliant historian at, uh, at Yale who had written the book on tyranny. And Snyder came up with this wonderful image of the January exception, which meant basically that if a president who tried to storm the Capitol or otherwise prevent his ex exclusion from office by having lost an election, if the president could get away with anything simply because the 
uh, Congress doesn't count the electoral votes till January 6th. And that's just a short time before the inauguration of the next president on January 20th. If, if that gap of time created a loophole during which the president could get away with murder, not just shooting someone on Fifth Avenue, but shooting our democracy, then we would be done for. Uh, and I thought that was a very wonderful way of capturing why there could not be the rule for which Judge Leonard and, and a few others had, had, uh, had expressed support, uh, a rule that says that impeachable offenses that occur in January simply can't be regressed by excluding a president from future office holding, which is one of the remedies that the framers provided. That created quite a problem for most of the Republicans who realized that Trump had clearly committed an impeachable offense, the most dramatic impeachable offense imaginable, basically tried to overturn the results of a free and fair election and hold on to power. Um, so they had to come up with something. And what they came up with was, well, it's too late because Mitch McConnell succeeded in preventing the Senate from coming back into session. Now we have an ex-president and we can't finish the process that we began. That was a crazy argument, but it was easier for them to line up behind it than to line up behind the even crazier argument that basically treason against the United States and attempted insurrection, uh, that that was not impeachable. So the January exception, hopefully that will not be the precedent that we've established, because if it is, we're really done for. So before we leave Judge Luddick, you were involved in some litigation. Uh, you were counsel to um, Coca-Cola, uh, uh, brought a suit against the uh, Internal Revenue Service. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that case and what the constitutional issue in that case was? Well, it's not so much that we've sued the Internal Revenue Service. It's that after the impeachment business where, where Judge Luddick and I you know, opposed one another on various issues, although he and I both agreed that Mike Pence did not have the authority that the president sought to get him to use, namely to overturn the election and simply declare Trump president. Uh, after that period, Michael Ludig was brought on board by Coca-Cola uh, to oppose the Internal Revenue Service for what it had done by basically engaging in a bait and switch. It had told Coca-Cola to calculate its taxes in a certain way. And then suddenly it said, whoops, it, now that you followed our instructions, we're gonna slap a multi-billion dollar penalty on you. And Judge Ludig asked me, did I have any constitutional thoughts about that? And I said, I sure do. I've done some work in my, in my past saying that the government has to keep its word, it can't, it can't pull the rug out from under people. There are plenty of constitutional precedents about ex post facto laws and violations of due process. And he said, well, uh, would you be willing to help Coca-Cola fight the IRS here? And I wanted to know more details, but in the end I said, sure. So I've been appointed constitutional counsel for Coca-Cola in what looks like it's going to be quite a long battle against the Internal Revenue Service where the stakes are many billions of dollars. And I, I, I think and hope we will prevail because I think for any government agency to be able to basically pull the rug out from under people, tell them to follow a certain course of action and then say that they're gonna be penalized for doing so violates the rule of law. So we're working together on that. Although, I mean, that's not atypical, I often, work with people on some issues, even though I dis disagree with them on others. So let's leave the um, those obscure constitutional provisions of our um, 18th century constitution. Let's move ahead into the 19th century. Like uh, how about 1871, um, Ku Klux Klan Act um, uh, and its um, uh, modern enforcement mechanisms uh, recently uh, two members of Congress, Congressman uh, Benny Thompson and Congressman uh, Eric Sol uh, Solwell, um, brought lawsuits, civil lawsuits, uh, using that um, 
that act. Can you tell us a little bit about that and who were the parties involved? Yes, sure. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Congressman Thompson uh, sued Donald Trump in his personal capacity together with, I guess, the Proud Boys and some other- the Oath Keepers. Uh, oath yeah. Keepers, right, sued them for violating this 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act uh, by basically inciting people to revolution and insurrection uh, and interfering with their ability to perform their duty in counting the electoral votes. And then more recently, in a more elaborately developed lawsuit, Eric Swalwell uh, of California has filed a suit uh, against Donald Trump, Donald Jr., uh, Giuliani, and a member of Congress, Mo Brooks, for a conspiracy to basically prevent the peaceful transition of power uh, and to cause severe damage, including death, in the course of doing that. Uh, both of these lawsuits, I think, are very well conceived, and they are grounded in legislation that actually goes back not only to 1871, but it has roots going back to 1790. The basic thrust of the legislation is to say that when people are performing their official duties, those who gang up to prevent them from doing it, and at various times in our history, various groups of thugs have done that, sometimes white supremacists like the Ku Klux Klan, those who gang up and conspire, sometimes including public officials and others in their conspiracy to prevent the performance of those duties are liable in damages to the people that they injure through that conspiratorial process. Well, it turns out, obviously, that when Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and the Proud Boys and all these characters got together uh, and over a period of time invited people to come to Washington on January 6th, not a date chosen coincidentally, but the very date that the Electoral College votes would be counted and tried to get them to prevent the counting of those votes and the certification of Biden as the president, that was a classic violation of these old statutes. And the statutes include a provision in section 1986 that says that anybody who knows this is going on and has power to stop it but doesn't is also guilty. Well, that's Donald Trump. He, at least these lawsuits, or at least the one by Swalwell, plausibly alleged that he knew what was going on. He had the ability, both as a charismatic demagogue and as the president who could have called in the National Guard to stop it. He chose not to. That makes him liable for the damages, and the damages are considerable. So these lawsuits, I'm very excited to watch them go forward. They're in the District of Columbia. I hope they get assigned to an open-minded judge. I think that they really opened the door to holding Trump and his associates accountable for the racketeering injury that they caused. Well, before we get to the damages, there's something very exciting about this uh, that occurs to me. It's uh, after we get past the various motions that will be made to dismiss the case, et cetera, et cetera, it's discovery time. Mm -hmm. I assume that uh, discovery will be video recorded. Uh, they'll be under oath. Um, and of course, uh, the president might be asked a question or the former president asked a question. And of course he would invoke the fifth and then he'd be reminded that he, um, he might at that, point, at that point disclose whether or not uh, he self pardoned. So that would come up in that context. And I guess uh, other people uh, could be um, uh, subpoenaed uh, to testify uh, uh, like, um, or, or for a deposition like Senator Lindsey Graham? It's going to be a discovery of Palapuzo or and Cornucopia or whatever the image is. It's going to be, the discovery will be very interesting. And and do you know that if, if those were, uh, well, I'm sure they'll be video recorded, they could, be, that could be shared with the public in real time? Sure. I mean, there's nothing, it's not like grand jury proceedings, which are, which are private, depositions can be entirely public. But I think it, we're getting a little ahead of our skis here. We, we don't know quite what the motions to dismiss will look like, the motions for summary judgment, 
Um, I think that the claims are very strong, both legally and factually, uh, but it'll take a while. I mean, the, the wheels of justice yeah. don't exactly grind quickly. You know, the attempt to subpoena um, Chipolone, the, the White House counsel who refused to do Donald Trump's bidding back in the Mueller days, the attempt to enforce that subpoena is still pending in the courts years later. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of the things that ought to be done when we get around to it is enacting legislation that says that certain kinds of subpoenas in the course of impeachment inquiries or congressional oversight inquiries need to be ruled on within a date certain by the district court that whatever the ruling is needs to be appealed immediately to an appellate court, the Supreme Court, and so on. Uh, we really can't have endless, endless litigation over subpoenas if we're to make enforceable a lot of the provisions of the Constitution that are otherwise just not worth much more than the paper they're written on. Uh, two grand juries right now uh, in Fulton County, Georgia, are inquiring into uh, possible uh, voting law and racketeering violations that may have been committed by the former president and others. Uh, what's your view of the pros and cons of that? Well, I think the grand juries need to be convened. I think the evidence suggests at least strong indication that crimes were committed in Georgia, crimes involving election fraud and election manipulation, uh, similar offenses in other jurisdictions. I think it would be a terrible mistake to decide in advance, either on the one hand, we cannot afford to go down a road that could lead to putting the president in an orange jumpsuit, or on the other extreme saying, you know, we have to, you know, run down that road and make sure he goes to jail. We have to follow the evidence where it leads. Merrick Garland, I think, who is an extremely thoughtful, cautious, principled prosecutor, he was a student of mine back in the day. He was a brilliant prosecutor in the Oklahoma bombing case. He's going to follow the evidence where it leads. Biden, who I also know and respect, is not going to put political pressure on Merrick Garland either way once Garland is confirmed. I think it would be just premature to say that the, the dangers of looking like a banana republic because we prosecute ex-presidents are somehow exceed the dangers of letting ex-presidents get away with worse than murder. We, we just have to see. So um, Justice um, Amy Coney Barrett has changed the makeup of the court uh, where it used to be a five to four court. It's now a six to three court. Can you tell us what we might expect in terms of major reconfigurations of federal law? When you say five, four, six, three today, there was an eight to one decision where the one was <laughs> Robert and the, and the eight were led by Thomas. I thought, uh, I thought, go, go figure. I mean, this is the first time that Roberts has found himself the solo dissenter. Uh, I don't hold out much hope for a great many decisions that are that surprising and strangely oriented. No doubt the the replacement of, of the legendary uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg with Amy Coney Barrett uh, is going to tilt the court to the right on any number of issues. And we're going to see how that plays out. No question that it will be much more accommodating to claims of religious exception, much less willing to accept various forms of so-called affirmative action, much less protective of voting rights, much more skeptical of government regulation, even more uh, willing to replace lawsuits with arbitration, uh, even more inclined to rule with corporate power, even less willing to accept restrictions on the use of money in politics. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what the tilt will be. There'll be less protection for reproductive freedom, less protection for women. The court is tilting right in many ways, but as today's eight to one decision shows, there are occasional surprises and 
oddly, those surprises play into the hands of those who say, oh, <laughs> you know, it's not politics, it's all law. Well, yes, it's all law, but in the end, politics trumps law in many important areas. So let me add, end with a final question because we want to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, and the question concerns uh, the survival of our constitutional democracy. Uh, we live in a time where uh, malapportionment of the Senate, uh, this is the rule, uh, partisan gerrymandering is the, is the rule, big money in politics uh, is the rule. Uh, we have right now um, lawmakers in 43 states that are proposing legislation to curb uh, voting rights. Is it really that bleak? Pretty bleak. I mean, I tend to be an optimist. Yes, 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 yes. I, I see, I hear trouble echoes. I, I don't know if it's emblematic of the of the depth of your question that I hear echoes of my of my answer, but it could be that bleak. But I do tend to think we've overcome enormous challenges before and we might overcome this one. But at the moment, we need pretty structural change if we're going to really get very far, because otherwise we came close enough, really, within 43,000 votes in three or four states uh, to, to losing everything to Donald Trump, who would then perhaps never have left office. Uh, we came awfully close. And next time there may be an even savvier and smarter and less confused and chaotic uh, autocrat and demagogue. So we really need to, you know, we need to keep our guard up because it's not at all guaranteed that unlike other democracies, ours will somehow last indefinitely. I think Holmes said uh, it was an experiment. Um, so uh, as, as all I, life, as he said, it all life is an experiment. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I and I, and speaking of structural changes, I had somehow skipped over the electoral college. Um, yeah, well, uh, that's one of my least favorite institutions. <laughs> I have to say, the electoral college has really tripped us up a few times. It's crazy. It's really crazy that somebody can can lose by almost eight million votes the way Trump did and yet be so close to having won the election so that he can claim that fraud and the violation of various rules ultimately make the current president illegitimate, which is what his, his position is. But of course, even without the Electoral College, he would presumably be saying that the tens of, well, the 8 million people who voted against him are not real people because they're brown uh, or they're Democrats. Uh, or their elites, or God knows what else. So with that, let's turn to Rebecca. Rebecca, do you have some questions uh, from, our, from our audience? Oh my, yes. <laughs> yes, we have lots of questions coming in. So if folks have a question, you can type it into the comment and I will do my darndest to get through them. Um, the, one of the first ones that came in was from Kathy, and I'm actually going to expand upon her initial question, which was, what is the most pressing hole in the Constitution that needs to be implemented to help hold a rogue president to account? And I was wondering, given the fact that you actually helped write constitutions, if you could zhuzh up today our Constitution, if you were given that power, what would you do? Would How be. would you tidy it up? Yeah, I would decline the power. I would decline the invitation. I don't regard myself as having the wisdom that it would take. In fact, although I would not be irreparably opposed to a new constitutional convention, I would really want it to be crowdsourced the way uh, the Icelandic convention has been. I'd want it to take account of a great diversity of views I would not want it to be dictated from the top down, but I'd want it to be formulated from the ground up, and I would decline, decline the invitation. In fact, when I helped South Africa and the Marshall Islands and other countries write their constitutions, one of my conditions was I, I'm not sort of a James Madison, have constitution, will travel. I'm there to help them figure out how to formulate their own future and not to impose a structure from the top down. So with all respect, I would say, next question, please. <laughs> would there be any particular um, 
opinions you would want to hear from the crowd if we were to crowdsource it? Sure. Well, I'd certainly want to hear their opinions on how many things should be done by plebiscite, by kind of polling the population as a whole, other than through a representative system. I'd want to know to what extent they might be willing to buy into a formula of deliberative democracy of a kind that forms committees from the ground up and gradually formulates consensus. I'd want to know to what extent they wanted protection against the impulses of the moment, the kinds of protection that lead people to favor, you know, a Senate that is not fully representative or to favor the Electoral College or to favor the filibuster. Uh, and I'd want to know how people would want to trade off rights like anonymity and privacy on the one hand against transparency and accountability on the other, all kinds of things I'd want to know. But there are certain basics that I think any constitution has to preserve, basic protection for human dignity, human rights, and you know, the, the protection of people against uh, oppression based on who they are as opposed to what they do. Ron, do you have any follow-up question to that, or you want me to just keep going? Keep going, keep going, yeah. Okay, um, so for those of you who may be tuned in a little bit later, we found out that uh, Professor Tribe's background is actually in mathematics. And so Jane wanted to know, can you explain to a layperson why mathematics has had such an, such an effect on you, and has it influenced your work with the law? Well, it's hard for me to know why it's had such a deep effect, but it certainly influences my way of thinking about things. I think about things in terms of structures rather than just words in a, in a string of some kind. I think much of mathematics explores invisible structures, multidimensional structures, how things hang together. So I'm not as enamored of interpreting the text literally as I am of figuring out how it how it form how it forms architectural complexes. I mean it, it, I, I, I hear what I'm saying and it sounds it sounds way fancier than I mean. What I really mean uh, is that that mathematics really taught me the beauty of how things hang together. And when I look at the Constitution, I kind of tend to look at it as a whole. I look at what's between the lines as, as well as what's written in them. I look at the, at the planes and angles and intersections. Uh, it's not that I look, count things up. I'm not particularly arithmetic. I'm interested in more in algebraic topology and in geometry than I am in, in uh, differential calculus. Um, mathematics was a contrast for me. Mathematics has right answers and wrong answers. And you really can put QED at the end of an equation. There are no absolutely right and wrong answers in law. The contrast has been humbling uh, and it's made me think about the importance of including sort of human emotion, human passion, human commitment in law. There's very little room for that in mathematics and yet it's beautiful. There are eternal truths in mathematics. I mean, e to the i pi plus one equals zero, the famous Euler theorem, one of the most beautiful truths ever, doesn't have any implications really for how, you, how decently you need to treat your fellow human being. And that very contrast is humbling and it makes me think what I loved about mathematics and what I love about law are really quite different but complementary. So thank you. That was a wonderful answer. Um, so we're going to turn to some freedom of speech questions. Uh, Janice had one, and then I'm going to do a follow-up because one just came in as well from Fred. So Janice wants, wanted to know, do you think that First Amendment freedom of speech standards in the U.S. will evolve to resemble those of some European countries, which outlaw certain types of hate speech? And then Fred uh, just submitted, how can balance... Uh, how can we balance out freedom of speech with the Wild West influence of alternative truth emanating from social media? So where do you see freedom of speech and all of that? Well, those questions are so huge and so challenging. I spend so much of my life struggling with them. I really don't want to give bumper sticker answers. I doubt that we will 
move very far in the direction of the European willingness to outlaw speech that is deemed by the central government to be more misleading or hateful than true. I mean, you know, as the survivor of people who were killed in the Holocaust, I'm as upset as anybody when people are Holocaust deniers. But the idea that we could live in a country where you go to jail for denying the Holocaust really is, cuts against the grain for me. I doubt that we will become such a country. I think American exceptionalism on the free speech spectrum is likely to last and I think is a healthy thing. On the other hand, I think we tend to invoke notions of free speech a little too casually. Uh, that is, when we talk about free speech as though there were no countervailing values, like the value of, of equality, of influence, um, when we use free speech slogans to almost lochnerize, that is to, to deregulate, to, to essentially deregulate the, the influence of wealth and corporate power on politics, we may be going too far. Um, I also, I also think that the role of free speech has to be recalibrated in light of the power of the internet and of social media. Uh, not that we have to abandon certain fundamental axioms, but that we have to accommodate them to the realities of, of the modern world. The notion, you know, the notion that you can correct lies with counter speech has to be modulated to recognize how difficult it is to take lies that have traversed the Twitterverse uh, quickly and deeply, how, how unrealistic it is to think you could simply pull them back. And so we have to think about what kinds of regulation there need to be of powerful privately owned, but nonetheless globally influential media. Uh, but I haven't myself worked out all the details of how I think Section 230, the immunity uh, provision of 230, ought to be tweaked in light of current circumstances. I do think kind of an open, almost consistent with the philosophy of free speech, a more open-minded view of how freedom of speech should be conceptualized in the modern world is appropriate. We ought not to take too much as absolutely axiomatic. But the notion that there should be no central power that determines for all time what is true and what is false, what is worth saying and what is not, that's absolutely, absolute bedrock. Um, and I think that, that anything that would give Big Brother the power to make those decisions would be uh, would be disastrous. Okay, so I'm going to make you do another weighty question, just because I can't. Don't you have a nice, a nice light one to toss into the mix? No, no, come on. How many times in my life do I get you cornered like this, and I'm in control of the questions? Oh, now, wow. come on. I know. See, Ron, look at the power you've given me. Speaking of power. Um, so one question that just came in uh, from Flora was, um, we claim to believe that there is an arc of history which tends towards justice. Um, and so how do we move toward a return to justice and fairness? Well, sort of step by step is an easy way to answer it. I mean, it seems to me that we have to seize the opportunities that are ahead of us to make progress as we can when we have the presidency and we have the House and we have the Senate, we can't waste the opportunity with provisions like HR1 and with things like the $1.9 trillion uh, package that I think makes greater progress toward economic justice than almost anything since the New Deal. We have to take those steps. But the notion that the moral arc of the universe necessarily bends toward justice and that we are always going to find things moving in a positive direction, I think is a, is a dangerous illusion. Uh, we have to bend that arc ourselves. We can't count on any inexorable 
an inexorable force of nature to bend it. Um, and because we don't really agree ultimately on what is just, what human dignity requires, because there are, as I wrote in one of my books about abortion, clashes of absolutes. Um, we also cannot assume that we agree on what the ultimate goal at the end of that rainbow is. We have to engage in the struggle and it is the struggle toward a, a, a more just society that I think is, is worth committing ourselves to. I, I know when Barack Obama was my student, the part he most liked about the constitution and in particular its preamble was the notion that it is in order to move toward a more perfect union that we dedicate our efforts. Not that we know what a perfect union would be like or expect that we would ever get there, but the struggle itself is worthwhile. I mean, when people ask, you know, did you, were you upset that, that your effort to, to um, work with Jamie Raskin to convict and disqualify this president didn't ultimately work? The answer is sure, I would have been happier if it had, but being part of a struggle that felt right, that seemed just, was its own reward. I also think, and this is not exactly an answer to your question, but all of us you know, who are lucky enough to be on this podcast or webcast or whatever you call it, all of us who are lucky enough to have the, the luxury to be able to engage in a Zoom and talk to each other about important issues, um, should realize that you know, it's luck. We didn't, we didn't uh, get ourselves here. We, we got here just by virtue of accidents of birth and of upbringing and of education. And that gives us all an obligation to pay back, to do something toward the struggle for a more just America, a more just world. Um, I don't think any of us should take for granted the opportunities that, that we have as professors or, or as as you know, participants in this kind of Zoom, this kind of Zoom meeting, we should realize that we're very lucky to be here, all of us. I mean, I'm lucky to have survived World War II. I was born in war-torn Shanghai a couple of months before Pearl Harbor, but for a few accidents, I wouldn't exist. All of us are in that situation. I, I really like that aspect of Michael Sandel's work, his most recent book about elites and how how much they should realize that. You know, but for the grace of God, they wouldn't be where they are. So we all have an obligation uh, to do what we can to bend that arc. And that's what I hope to do. Larry, uh, if I may, um, your, your comment about struggle reminded me of a quote. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it from Albert Camus. And it's something along these lines. I do not give the human race more than one chance in a thousand, but I would not be a man if I did not act on that chance. Albert Camus. Uh, I think we have time. Uh, if, if we can go, would you mind if we go over five minutes, Larry? Oh, I, I don't have my watch on. What time is it we now? Can talk right now. And if that doesn't work, we'll. Uh, we'll, why, uh, we'll why don't we close it in a couple of minutes? Okay. Well, do we have time for one quick question? Uh, did you want me to pose one more question? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, the last one, uh, yeah. one that I thought was interesting. Um, is because it's about to happen, it is happening on two fronts. So you mentioned HR1, um, uh, but there's also a Supreme Court case that's going to be heard tomorrow regarding voting rights, if I'm correct. Yeah. So Michael wants to know what can or should be done to secure and protect voting rights. And I'm only asking that because that is an issue near and dear to my heart, so. Well, I, I wish we had a different Supreme Court because I'm not at all confident that this one will do with the voting rights case that's being heard tomorrow, much of what it, it ought to do. I, I do think that we need ultimately to get rid of the electoral college. It's gonna be a slow grind. The uh, national popular vote initiative is uphill, but it's not impossible. And it could be a way of circumventing the electoral college. Uh, the Supreme Court has been terribly disappointing both on on the Voting Rights Act in, in, uh, in the Shelby case uh, and on gerrymandering, um, I think we're gonna have to keep struggling. I don't, I don't have a, a, a quick answer for you. The question of whether we should change the composition of the court, expand it, 
adopt term limits. All of those questions are on the table uh, and I don't have easy answers to any of them. Very good. With that, we will uh, close and is as is our tradition uh, and we'll do it in just a moment, we'll applaud you. I mean, uh, but before we do, uh, I just want to thank you for all of the decades of your life uh, that you've dedicated to defending our constitution. And uh, we all look forward to uh, that time, hopefully this year, when we can return and talk more about you and your remarkable life in the law.